Hey guys, it's Eric here at Farpoint Farms. Check it out. It's time for another part to the solar array series. We're building a new solar system and I'm taking you along as beginners into that journey. In part one, we talked about solar panels and the different types. In part two, we talked about angling your solar array. And today we're going to talk about charge controllers. Now charge controllers come in two types. PWM is the common lower cost version and MPPT is the higher end version. Let's talk about the differences. For a simple car setup, something where you want to have just the basics, for a simple, I want to run my refrigerator setup, you're likely to aim yourself directly at one of these PWM systems like this one right here. Now these are great for what they are. They usually cost no more than $20. In fact, I bought a few of them for less than 10 back before inflation took hold and they work. The problem with them, however, is that they are not the most efficient way of harnessing energy from your solar panels. MPPT controllers on average will generate 11 to 11 and a half percent more energy out of the same solar panel. And the way they do this is by being able to work at much lower voltages or lower wattages. Where a PWM controller operates at you know, 12 volts or whatever your panel is putting out, when there's heavy cloud cover, when it is early morning, when it is getting close to evening and the sun is low in the horizon, those units do not charge at all. While an MPPT is able to convert much lower voltages and much lower wattages into usable energy to store in your battery. And I hope that makes sense. So there's that, right? We have the ability to take a small controller like a PWM here, hook it to one battery, hook it to one solar panel, and we can produce power for less than $100. In fact, in the links below, I'll leave a link to where I built a system just like that and shows you how for less than $100 you can power your refrigerator. Now on the other end, the MPPT controllers, they're going to cost you more out of the gate. Usually they start at around $100 and of course they can move up into the $1,000 range. The one that I have recently received is a, it's an all-in-one unit and these are a little more complicated than even the MPPT and I'll get into them here in a second, but they also install the inverter with the charge controller. The inverter we'll talk about in the next video here, but for right now, what you need to keep in mind is that an MPPT controller is probably your best bet if you're talking about having many hundreds of watts of solar charging. In my case, I have a 1200 watt array right now. We're building this into something far larger. And the MPPT controller allows me to take in a lot more energy with it. So for permanent installs, if you're going for something that's gonna you know, fire up maybe a refrigerator, maybe the microwave, maybe, maybe even a well pump, that is gonna give you that 11% more of charging and that can make a big difference if you're talking about a variety of cloudy days. Let's say you live in the Pacific Northwest where you get a lot of heavy rain and, uh, and a lot of cloud cover. MPPT controllers would be an easy pick. If you're living in Arizona where you hardly get any rain at all, well then a PWM controller might actually be just fine for you. So we have shown you the small blue controllers, those PWM controllers, very inexpensive. And a lot of your smaller all-in-one units that you get will have that. So the next thing we need to talk about here is how many amps these charge controllers can handle. That was something I really didn't think too much about at the time when I purchased my first one and it was an expensive mistake. A 20 amp MPPT charge controller operating at 12 volts can only handle 260 watts worth of solar paneling. That's not a lot. To upgrade to four or five or 600 watts of paneling requires replacing the controller with a higher amperage controller. You can see the waste. Now there are some ways around that, ways to stretch your system. If you move from 12 to 24 volts, well now you've gone into like 560 volts or 5, 520 I guess it would be. And if you went to 48 volt systems, and we'll get into what voltage you should choose at a later time here, well, then you could go up to almost 1100 watts of solar. So there are ways to squeeze more out of a smaller charge controller. But if you are going to be building a permanent setup on your property and you think you're going to expand in the future, your best bet is to get the highest amperage your wallet can afford. In my case, if I had gone straight to 100 
amp charge controller, I would have had enough amperage available that I could have run the system that I'm building now without replacing that. Because I don't, well, I have to buy yet another charge controller. So I went from a 20 to a 60, and now I'm going all the way up to a 200 to ensure that I'm never ever going to have to mess with that again. So let's talk about voltages. Voltages uh, offer a lot of positives and negatives as we go down the road. And while we're not gonna be getting into inverters or batteries in this video, we will talk briefly about them in part of this video. So stick around for videos on those as well. The simplest solar system you can build is a 12 volt solar system. It's not the most efficient and it's not the best option, but it's the simplest. Many items operate off of 12 volts from the factory, car stereos, CB radios, ham radio gear. A lot of things are designed to run off of 12 volts. We go camping, a lot of camping equipment is also designed. Many of the appliances in RVs and in campers are designed to run off of 120 or 12 volt systems. So it makes sense to purchase a 12 volt solar setup out of the gate, especially if you're gonna be doing mobile type installs. The downside to it is, again, you need a lot more charge controller to handle a lot more panels when we're dealing in 12 volt systems. There also is line loss. That's a voltage drop that occurs. So if you're going to be placing your batteries farther away from wherever your solar setup is, the amount of cabling and the size of that cabling has to be altered in order to continue to have 12 volts at the other end. And so there's a lot of reasons not to go with 12 volts. When I built mine, I looked into that. And again, I chose because of money at the time to purchase a 24 volt system. The upside to that is that you have the ability to add more paneling for the same amount of amperage on your charge controller, but you're stuck with having to use something called a step down converter. If you want to run a direct 12 volt item off of your system, that's the downside for home installations. That's not that big of a deal because honestly, you're just not going to be doing that. But there is some things to consider. Your cheapest, most inexpensive inverter, which again we'll get into next time, is going to be a 12 volt inverter. Well, if you decide to up your system to a 24 volt system, you cannot just take that 12 volt inverter and plug it in, or you're gonna have spark flying. <laughs> so you have to size your system accordingly. If I'm going to build a bigger system, and I know that this is just step one, I'm going to recommend to you that you go with a 48 volt system. That's a 48 volt system set up right from the start. You're paneling wired in 48 volt, your inverter wired for 48 volt, and your solar charge controller wired in 48 volt. But if you're going with RV use, most of the time a 12 volt system is going to be fine. So those are the main differences between your charge controllers. Your PWM controllers usually handle a much lower output and much lower amperage. We're looking at very small setups, say two or 300 watt setups at 12 volts, where your MPPT controllers can usually go all the way from those small 12 volt systems up to 48 volt monster systems with six, seven or 8,000 watts of power. So it really depends on what you want. What is your plan? Are you planning on just running a refrigerator when the power goes out? Well, then you can pretty much build on a budget. But if you're planning on trying to go completely off grid, it's important for you to realize that a little bit more spent now will save you having to spend it all over again later. That's it for tonight, my friends. In part four, we'll get into batteries, the well, the storage, the gas tank, as I like to call them. There are two different types and there are different voltages that we can run them at. And then in part five, we'll talk about inverters and also talk more about the fact that you can buy all in one units now. And lastly, in part six, we'll talk about grid tie systems and off-grid systems where you still have power coming into your house. That'll wrap up the series, my friends. And until then, take care.